And checking one, two, three. Hey, this is John Ree with another edition of my rebooted podcast series now called Enterprise Hits and Misses Radio. Uh, yes, we are about to go live on LinkedIn. In fact, it's probably already streaming, but there may be a second delay. So uh, welcome to the show. And uh, I've got VJ VJS Sankar here, my triumphant returning champion. I was I was trying to figure out when you first did a podcast with me, and I think it was 2009. I'm sure I can figure it out with a little more effort, but it was right around then. Yeah, it seems like a long time ago. It's so fantastic to do this again with you. Yeah, it's it's good times. So uh, for those of you who are uh, joining up into the feed, uh, I'm going to be talking with VJ in a special countdown edition of our show. We're going to first we're going to count down our most hated predictions for 2021. Uh, which is going to be really tough to narrow that down to the four. And then I've challenged VJ. This this will get even tougher for him. He's got to pick his five favorite blog posts of all time that he's written on his blog. Dude, that's going to be tough. You've written a lot of stuff. So that that's, is, like, that's like asking asking you to pick your favorite child or your favorite dog. You know? <laughs> well, the, the one good thing is I'm not totally, you know, emotionally attached to what I write, right? So it's it's that part is fine. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to finding out. And I, I've actually picked your your top blog posts as well that, for me. So we'll have a nice back and forth on that. Yep. Uh, anyone who's watching, feel free to chime in as we go. Um, and and the other thing um, is that VJ and I haven't compared notes here on what we're gonna what we're gonna pick. So, uh, but the one thing I did on the on the teaser plug for the show, um, I, I said we're gonna talk about AI next gen projects leadership and more and that's because those are topics that vj <clears throat> i know you're passionate about that you've written a lot on <clears throat> in the past so i'm sure i felt confident those topics are going to come up one way or the other so yes, indeed. Um, yeah absolutely but before we get into any of our countdowns i do want to take a little step back here because i was thinking about uh you know just the evolution of your career because you started out as a programmer i did and then i remember many years where you were you know, an SAP consultant, because I remember back in the day, we'd look forward every year to your road ahead for SAP consultants post, right? Where you kind of, you know, so it's really interesting to see that whole thing evolve. And I just wanted to sort of ask you about, like, when when did the whole thing around realizing that, that blogging your way through your career was going to be like a key part of everything? Like, when, when did that start to occur to you? Uh, sometime in the mid 2000s for sure um in the 2007 or so time frame is what i think um the right timeline would be it's it's all thanks to marilyn pratt right i mean there's uh, like, yep the marilyn pratt literally, shout out yep literally nobody else um, deserves credit for that right so uh she was the one who gently prodded me onto the sen platform and then later bpx right the business process mm. expert platform um, and I wrote something there, and uh, like after I posted like my third one, she kind of highlighted it in the homepage, so a lot more people started reading what I write. Um, and then I think a year or two later, maybe two years later or so, um, I figured there are a lot of topics that I, I like to write about, but SEN is probably not the right place to say those things. So <laughs> I, I went ahead and created a WordPress blog site and then I eventually bought a domain and vjsays.com and, and right. so that, yeah. That, that's how it, it, it's been going. So about 10 years since I've had my own blogging site, uh, probably have written, I have no idea actually how many I've written, but I'm going to guesstimate maybe 500 blogs in that time. Um, I do write about 40, 50 a year, I think. And you know, I'm not particularly structured and it's not like I post a blog a week or anything like that. There are days when I've posted two and there are months I have posted nothing, right? So it's whenever whenever that that happens, that inspiration comes, I whip out my phone and I, I type it. So uh, I'm not going to allow any uh, of the audience members to ask you questions about uh, IBM, like, you know, like, for example, all the moves that have happened lately because uh, – I we didn't go through IBM PR and I didn't want to go through IBM PR because we would never be doing this show. <laughs> it would just take, no, take too long. Absolutely, me, right? Um, yeah. When, uh, but but why don't you why don't you just just for the sake of context why don't you just like give us a sense of what you currently do now? 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, at the moment, I'm an integrated services leader uh, at IBM. What, what that essentially means is we do two types of services for our clients. Um, everything on the infrastructure side and everything on the consulting side. So on the infrastructure side is what we call global technology services and the, the consulting side is what we call global business services. Um, I lead the teams for both for one of our largest uh, clients and definitely the oldest client that we have who we have had the privilege of having as a client for 107 years. So it's a uh, uh, it's a pretty cool, uh, cool job. Uh, first time that I'm uh, I'm doing that role, um, and prior to that, I, I was the CTO for North America. So it's a nice change of pace to move from a very technology oriented role to um, back to a PNL position, but only for one client, right? So it's a uh, yeah, that that's uh, that's my day job. Do you ever miss the uh, the hands on stuff, whether it's the coding or the configuration of ERP systems or what have you? Do you ever, do you ever miss that stuff? Uh, so I, I strangely don't miss ERP very much. You know, I haven't opened <laughs> an SAP screen since uh, 2012, I think, or maybe 2013. Um, I, I'm still very much in touch with uh, the SAP world, at least, right? So mm. um, I, I loosely keep track of what happens there, but you know, I haven't tried anything hands-on. But from a programming perspective, I'm fairly hands-on as, and I still code. You know, uh, it's very difficult for me to, um, you know, spend any week where, where I don't type some code. So that happens all the time, right? I, uh, I'm I'm a developer at heart first and foremost, so I, I'm I'm still quite sharp in my coding skills. I keep telling my wife that you know, if the IT executive gig doesn't pan out, uh, this is Plan B, right? I can always go back and code for a living. Absolutely. So we're we're pretty far into the into the pandemic life now. Like like putting putting vaccines and return to work stuff aside. How are you feeling about like the state of project delivery at the moment? Uh, is is it the kind of thing where we're now able to resume pretty much even the largest scale projects, or is there a little still a little more hesitancy around the the big initiatives at this point? So not not really, right? And this honestly surprises me, though we, we shouldn't be surprised, at, at least in our case. So I have a very large team, right? There are thousands of people uh, that you know that uh, report into me. We switched to remote working in two days flat, uh, with no loss in productivity. Uh, but the reason for that, obviously, is you know it's it's. It's part of a, a business continuity process that you know we have to test it and certify it, and you have to stay ready for this eventuality. Nobody thought, I mean, certainly not me, uh, that we have to ever do it at this scale. Mm -hmm. But when the time came, we knew exactly what to do to get everybody remote, uh, and that happened so smoothly to the extent that our clients even started asking us, "So when are you guys going to uh, move back home?" Uh, to work because they didn't see any any loss of productivity and uh, they were actually quite uh, quite surprised that we had already moved in two days. Mm -hmm. So um, we haven't seen any difficulty with remote work in terms of our ability to deliver. Right, so that's uh, uh, that's been a blessing. I mean, obviously uh, the good process and you know diligence and so on helped. So I uh, I give the process some credit, but it's mostly people, right? I mean, it's amazing to me that none of us have ever in our lives worked 100 percent remote i certainly haven't and i have done this a long time i've worked remotely but i would always go to a client site you know fairly frequently or to an ibm office or something so this is the longest in my my entire working career that i'm, I'm working sitting at my home office all the time uh and same is true with uh, several colleagues and you know everybody adapted and it's not without its stress levels. Yeah, mm. Unforeseen things do happen. I mean, one of my favorite moments is a younger colleague of mine who has a young son, you know, probably five, seven years old or so. Uh, he was having a business review with me and I saw the kid behind. So the dad is facing the computer like I am. I could see the kid behind the scene. I could see him take aim with a Frisbee. And like a half second later, the Frisbee came and knocked the MacBook out of the table, right? The one that I was oh. watching. So I could see the Frisbee coming and hitting like in a split second. And the Perfect laptop. Shot. 
<laughs> and the dad called me in panic. I apologize. Oh God, so funny. It's totally cool, you know. It's, so and I have other colleagues, you know, including executives in IBM who have very young children, right, young babies, who often have the baby on their lap when they come into a meeting. And that's totally fine, too. I mean, we know each other's families very well. Many of my colleagues know my daughter very well because, you know, if daddy is stuck in the room for a long time, she usually sneaks in with a little snack to keep daddy going. So uh, everybody knows each other's families well, pets well. You know, I have a couple of dogs, so they sometimes jump up on my lap while I'm on a meeting. Nobody takes it bad, right? They have colleagues, customers, my bosses, um, clients. No, nobody takes it bad. It's, but it, it comes with its own stresses. And the one thing I learned was nobody has all the answers, right? So yeah. uh, initially, we tried to take a stance that, you know, maybe we can cut down to answers fast so we, you know, we avoid chaos and keep moving. The reality is nobody. I certainly don't, right? So we, we have been having regular checkpoints and so on and try to minimize fatigue for people. Everybody overworked a lot initially, right? So that lack of productivity lost mm-hmm. that we saw. It was mostly because people were killing themselves. It took some time for us to all realize that we are just burning out and we calmed down and you know, got into a rhythm. Completely fine now. It's it's not as much of a challenge. Um, it's not that it's not a challenge. We just figured out a good way to to go about it. Yeah, interesting. You know, it. I actually think that's one of the the best things about the the pandemic life is the, in the business sense is is the the camming and the video meetings bring us into each other's lives in a way that I don't think we ever quite felt before. And no. despite the isolation, there's this interesting sense of like kind of getting to know people in a, in a different way, right? Like you got your kid on your lap, right? I mean, that's in a way that's kind of real, right? Like that's, that's our lives. And, 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 and the work life just barrier kind of went away a long time ago. Oh, so yeah. we might, we might as well like quit, quit pretending like we have this professional demeanor where there's no kids and there's, and we have a certain dress code and it's like, Come on, man. You know, like that, that, that wasn't working for years anyway. You know, since um, March or uh, early April, when, when we completely switched to this remote way of working, I think I had maybe three meetings in, in total out of, you know, God knows, thousand meetings where I actually wore a dress shirt, right? I, I show mm. up in a, in a regular t shirt. Uh, and mm. what you see is what you get, right? That's pretty much it. And it's it's the same with my colleagues and my um, my clients. First month or so, we would see people, you know, wearing a, a suit jacket onto right. a web call. Uh, that stopped very quickly. Everybody realized that that's not the important thing, right? So some people find it important to to dress up in the morning before they start work because it's sure. a it, it, it's a ritual, right? It gets them into yeah, the absolutely. Ritual. Totally fine. If that's your thing, do it, right? And But just don't, you know, make it a big deal if somebody else doesn't want to do it. It's also important that, you know, initially everybody thought being on video is the big thing. Then we quickly realized, you know, some of our colleagues uh, did not want to be on, on video. Um, yeah. You know, I had a, a, a very smart uh, woman, uh, lady in, in, in my team um who you know very openly said in the meeting hey early in the morning i don't have the time to get my my hair uh, in a shape that it's presentable i don't want to be on video and we said that's totally fine if you don't want to be on video don't be on video let's not make that the the you know the key to success right. so letting everybody find their own balance i think it's a, it's a it's a big part of getting to this equilibrium Cool. Uh, for those of you that are that are dropping in, uh, this that's kind of this show is designed to drop in and out a bit. Uh, we're going to start our countdowns pretty soon of the most hated predictions for 2021, and also VJ's favorite blogs. Uh, don't be afraid to comment in the stream, but just remember, if you comment, I'm going to respond to your comment. <laughs> this is not a passive video watching experience unless you want it to be so. Um, Anyhow, oh, by the way, VJ, I don't know if you can see that 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 video ticker in the top left, but there's more than two people watching right now. That thing is like, that's bullshit. Uh, so I, I checked on that before. I, I don't know what that is exactly, but anyhow, uh, volume metrics, man. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you also, just in terms of the project. So, like y- you said that 
large scale project delivery is not an issue. So that's 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 good. But I, I get the sense right that customers are are being pretty particular about the types of projects they want to do right now. So 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 where where is the action for for you guys as far as what the what the needs are right now? Everybody is constantly replanning, right? So um, it, it, it is hard that the macroeconomic forecasts have not been great, right? So the secondary tertiary effects of one industry hurting another or, or helping another, uh, that was not easy to find out at the beginning of the pandemic. So mm. what that means is, you know, when we say agile as a development methodology, Agile as a as a business practice, as in being nimble and being able to move fast, has mm. essentially meant that there is a lot of replanning. So, uh, right. it is a good thing that everybody understands that, and you know, backlog can be managed more dynamically these days, and you know, people don't feel a lot of grief about that. But we have seen tremendous replanning from from our client and also in house. Mm. You know, one, one day. You know, you're you're working on, um, say, solving a, a customer acquisition problem, and maybe that stops becoming an issue uh, because you know not a lot of customers are going to come in new. You, mm-hmm. you have to pivot very quickly to employee experience because now a lot of people who are not used to working from home suddenly need new solutions to be productive, and this team has to pivot, change their mindset from you know uh, an external. Uh, customer's uh, frame of mind to an internal employee's frame of mind uh, and design a solution for them, right? So that kind of big time pivots uh, used to be fairly rare in in the past. And we would deliberate on that uh, a a long time before we do those projects. Now, now that's not a a difficulty at all. We just jump in and and we pivot and we we start working on it very very quickly. So agility is definitely a a, a big deal now. Uh, VJ, we got Alan Berkson of uh, Freshworks uh, calling BS a little bit on agility. Do businesses really understand how to add, add agility? Yeah, uh, the <laughs> let me put it this way: there are parts of the business where agility is possible and parts where it is not, right? So there are hard problems like supply chain and a- actual manufacturing and so on where you cannot turn on a dime. You know, things do take a little bit of time to rejigger and and, and make it work. Um, it's it's a lot about the mental state, right? You you If you're used to a certain amount of work um, as, as your base estimate in mind, and suddenly the problem statement changed, it, it is pretty tough, right? So I did see um, Alan pretty much making the same point, right? That it's not just about tools. It's it's absolutely true. It is not about tools. It's, it's a mindset problem for the large part. But if mm. businesses did not get agility six months ago, I can more or less say with some certainty that they do get it now because it has become an existential crisis for many of them, right? So... Mm. Uh, it's now no longer a luxury. It's not a conference topic anymore, right? So they may not call it agility. They might just say, let's move faster, nimbler, cheaper, et cetera. But what they truly right. really mean is what the rest of us have been calling agility for a long time. None of them care about tools very much. But the reality is some of these tools, you know, especially one tool that I never used very much in the past, I use an awful lot now, is Mural. Um so Mural helps um, whiteboard very easily, right? So you can use like little sticky notes on a screen with several people in a team. You can quickly brainstorm, you can prioritize, etc. Things that you would typically get a team into a conference room on into a big whiteboard and do. Now we can we can mimic that to to some degree um, uh, with, with the help of a tool. So it's not that tools are bad. But tool doesn't make a project, right? It's it's that mindset change that it is important. And also understand things like, for example, John, you, you followed ERP for as long as I have, maybe longer. Uh, a lot of grief about ERP projects is these things called budget overrun and, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, estimates were bad and so on. Practically, nobody worries about those things anymore, right? Because you are not talking about two-year projects anymore. You are talking about mm-hmm. two-month projects, sometimes two weeks long projects. And everybody knows that things are so fluid that a lot of trust has built in the ecosystem that 
we may need to change or scrap very very quickly and people are not spending an, an inordinate amount of time worrying about it before we get into our countdowns i wanted to also mention that one of my favorite things about your blog is occasionally you'll you'll take on a buzzword and deconstruct it um and and the funny thing about it is that invariably, if you do that, within about six months in your job, you're now required to sell whatever it is that you dismantled before. It, it's uncanny, VJ. It's happened again and again. Oh my like, god! It, it, it is so true. It is and, so true. And and then you have to write the a, a blog post later saying, "Yeah, I do. I did take this apart like six months ago, but now let me explain it from this." And, and you made me think of it just now because you have a classic blog post in your and VJ says archives about Agile and making fun of Agile yeah, um, from I, like ten years ago or so. I think I, I think you've done it more than once. And but but you know, I I'll tell you where I come down on this is that I think that I think there's. There, there's a very specific methodology, which I think of as agile as a capital A, that it, that needs to be debated and understood in a very specific context of, of a way to manage a project. And there's actually a lot of very specific, almost scientific like methods around how that type of agile is done. Then there's agile with the small a, as, as I define it, which is more just being a more agile business, which is not as tied to the methodology. And, and to Alan, I think that's really what Alan's hitting at as well as in his point about agility. And the way I look at that is that that's a continuum. There's never an end state where you're agile. It's always something that you're you're pushing for and trying to get further. And and in my mind, the way the reason it makes sense is because why did we like go into like these holes for two years and come out and ask customers that they like this product? Like, why did we sign these two-year agreements without ever coming up for error? It makes so much more sense to have, you know, a, a cycle of constant feedback with all the stakeholder groups that you purport to serve. And, and to me, that's sort of the agile lesson. Now, to what extent you can incorporate that in your business and, it, and into your processes and into the software that you use is a whole different can of worms. Yeah, but, but it, it is, to be, um, to be perfectly honest, um, Agile is agile. The capital A agile is no magic bullet either, right? Um, yeah. And I had serious issues with that uh, throughout my career. I've written, probably, yeah, written and spoken out loud against it uh, a few times. Uh, it's it's not that I think it's a, it's a bad methodology. It's just it has its place. And when we uh, think that that is the only way to work, is when we land in trouble. Like you know, I keep. Uh, you know, making a joke that you, you don't build a rocket, right, with, with the capital A Agile. And the, there is a right. scaled version of this called uh, a scaled <laughs> Agile, right? It's a safe, right? The, the safe method, uh, which is awesome. But if you look at it, it would be, it would look, or at least in practice, it will approximate very closely to what a, a, an old school waterfall model looks like. Because for a certain amount of um, volume or, or structure, a lot of dollars being spent. Businesses want predictability, right? So no CFO will say that, okay, it, it takes whatever it takes. That almost never happens. So when you start putting all those constraints together, they want mm. some kind of predictability, which means here is a planned amount or effort or something, and here is the actual, and you want to compare these things. Mm. Pretty quickly, we are back to the old world, right? I mean, which is where the large SAP projects used to happen. We all cried out loud, right? Some some of us louder than others. So mm. th this is the thing, right? You you have an in between stage where things actually work quite fine, but when we take a religious approach that you know the capital A agile is the only way to do it, or waterfall is the only way to do it, and so on, that's when it it just gets ugly, right? Because that's not reality. It is, and business doesn't care at all, right? It's very hard to have a conversation with business on waterfall versus agile because it sounds trivial to them as in it's not important to them like right. uh, a finance organization that files regulatory reports um, it's tough for them to move out of um, cycle to to introduce a new change because the government expects something from them at, at certain periods and that needs a certain process like the close process every uh, every quarter so you can speed it up uh, a little and 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 so on but if you try to implement wholesale change in a short amount of time, it's not easy. Even during the pandemic, it is not easy. Mm. So that that pragmatic nature that you know the 
the religious definitions don't don't matter as much i think that realization the pandemic has definitely brought into both it and business i i see that routinely now mm, absolutely okay all right let's let's do a countdown of our top four most disliked predictions for 2020 21 i have a a few lined up let's start with you vj what no, no, I'll, I'll let you go first and I'll, oh you I'll... want me to do my my number four okay my number four um is courtesy of ZD, zdnet i'm not going to call out the author because i think sometimes uh these poor folks are required to do these tedious predictions pieces um and and by the way before i do it i will say that I do participate in this in kind of an antagonistic way with, with my annual Unpredictions collaboration with Brian Summer on Diginomica, uh, which is going to be out, I believe, next Tuesday. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do this weekend uh, polishing this up. Uh, and, and the infamous Den Hallett uh, has contributed some for the first time. So this is going to be a really juicy edition. Um, anyway, so uh, it, it's kind of our uh, cathartic reaction to the deluge of um, of predictions that we receive from from every uh, PR rep uh, in the United States and, and beyond. Um, anyway, so my number four is uh, in 2021, edge computing will hit an inflection point. Uh, this one's particularly brutal because uh, not only do you have the hype over edge computing, which is just a fancy way of saying stuff that you carry around with you or um, and then you combine that with inflection point, which is one of my most hated phrases because it's totally misused. As uh, Neil Re Raden pointed out, there's actually a, a, a very specific mathematical uh, definition that we've lost track of there. But uh, on top of that, um, Tom Dumlap asked me on Twitter, what, uh, what does it mean uh, when you reach that? And I said, it means that you can get paid as a consultant for talking about it when you don't know what it is. Um, so that's that's when you know you've reached an inflection point. So. Yeah, the, the thing about inflection point, and Neil makes a very good point, right? That you typically know an inflection point after the fact, right? You it's very exactly. right to say that it will hit an inflection point, right? A curve that exactly. keeps going in in one direction. It's hard to say that at that x amount of time, right? In uh, 2021, it's going to change direction. That. Uh, yeah, that's that's bullshit. So I I do agree on edge computing um, hitting an inflection point. Uh, I I do think it will happen, um, but putting a a timeline to it like this uh, definitely was a dumb idea. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it we, we can't. I mean, if we just look back at um, self driving cars, right? If we believed everything that the important people, I'm not going to take names, you know, because they are. Some of them are very close friends and so on. And we should have seen practically every other car on the road by now uh, as self-driving. That did not happen. It's not to say that 50% of the cars on the road won't be self-driving. In in very near future, it might happen. But people were so passionate about the topic, right, that they said that that will happen. You know, it's like the same thing. You know, it's all with good intentions, like uh, the fuel-based uh, energy production uh, will be next to nothing by 2020 is what we used to say, you know, right. 10 years ago. That did not happen, right? I mean, it is definitely coming down, but it, it did not happen. People yeah. underestimate this. <laughs> totally. well, well, VJ, you know, my favorite one is the IT skill shortage that was breathlessly predicted in like 1997 that we, we've never truly hit. It's just hilarious. It's like there's going to be a, a IT skills shortage crisis and uh, still waiting on that. Yeah, all now, these years. In, interestingly, right? So I'll tell my uh, my prediction, right? That that I I thought like went bonkers. Uh, is mainframe is dead? Uh, mainframe, right? Yeah, the death of the mainframe, right? Mainframe Put that in a timeline. Never died. I don't think mainframe will die before I die. Right? It's not going to happen. I. Obviously, I've made a lot of fun of mainframe and I did not know anything about mainframe. Now I know a lot about mainframe because my clients use it, right? So uh, I have studied about it and I understand the architecture better, so on and so forth. And it is actually quite difficult to get applications uh, that need that mainframe kind processing out of mainframe and put on a cloud. There are very serious technical limitations outside mainframe for those kinds of applications, not for everything. Mainframe is not needed for many of the applications. You can offload several workloads out of it. But 
the thing that mainframe is going to die no vast majority of planes and trains and others fly today because of mainframe based systems right weather forecasting right and and many many other things like bank transactions and so on insurance claims right or they all work on mainframes they were, they they worked on mainframes before i was born and they can't and I, i'm not young right so <laughs> it's been there for a while it will stay there for a while right so the mainframe being that is like one of my favorite predictions to poke fun at <laughs> all right let's hear your number 4 uh so the next one that i i would say and i definitely beg forgiveness from uh, several people here too too many to count on is uh, is blockchain right so again i am not anti blockchain i i do think blockchain serves several useful purposes but uh, blockchain replacing everything and becoming like uh, the ubiquitous uh, platform did not happen so Cer- most certainly did not happen right so instead of hundreds of thousands of projects we probably had hundreds or thousands of projects mm. at the most across the world right it did not become uh like the the common platform for everything in um, and and i don't think it will get there in in the next year either i i do believe uh, very much in the technology but uh it it does need more good problems and more people to so i'll i'll, I'll give one thing to uh, my blockchain friends the trouble is not the technology the trouble is not a lot of people like to come together on on any one platform the, the power of blockchain is when a lot of people get together on any one thing so for example a shipping company like mersk which actually worked with ibm to uh, have a, a blockchain solution that kind of worked because mersk was a big blockchain a uh, big uh, uh, player in in their market so when the big guy like a walmart or a mersk jumps in and can dictate that this is how this industry's future looks like yeah mm-hmm. then it, it kind of works everybody else will will fall in line but if you look at like 10 banks who all more or less do similar things they are all large enough that they all want to do their own thing it's pretty tough to get them all together on 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 one platform right they it's like the classic old sap thing like they all say my sales order processing is very different no it is not very different i know that because i worked in all 10 of uh, these companies but each company will still believe that they they are all unique right so that is primarily the big difficulty i see in in blockchain it's not really a technology challenge that's holding it back it's uh, everybody thinking they are unique or at least that's my my view on it what's your next one yeah and you know the 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 funny thing there too just as a contrast i think like i go back a few years ago i think about people who were saying that blockchain was going to revolutionize everything and and in fact it's ai that's become the pervasive technology and you know not that ai is necessarily changing everything we can talk about that and we're going to get to it but that you can contrast the two in terms of the the traction and you can see the difference not not every technology reaches the same level eventually blockchain when it matures is going to be a socket wrench in the tools that you can use on a project and that's just not sexy enough for the people that advocate for it but uh anyhow my number 3 i was going to do um I was going to make fun of a service mesh prediction be just because I can't stand the service mesh phrase but instead I chose uh, a prediction from uh, a company called Saisu no offense augmented analytics platform I wish you luck in 2021 but ditch the ditch the dashboard long live the dynamic feed manually created dashboards will finally start to give way as business owners uh consume data through uh dynamic views of data including insight news feeds and personalized results um well i hate to break it to you but dashboards aren't going anywhere nope and whatever it is your personalized dynamic feed is whatever the hell that is uh, i'd love love to see it um but it, anyhow sorry dashboards are here they're not going away we can debate how useful they are till the cows come home but executives love dashboards sorry yeah. Uh, absolutely true absolutely true i'll go to my my next one which um uh, is a is a common topic for both you and me right uh what or 7 8 years ago um sap made a prediction that hana will be the number 2 database oh my god uh, ouch dude ouch <laughs> uh oh. that, that did not happen uh 
deconstructing your former employer. Ouch. Oh. Yeah, it's not just formal employer. Uh, I actually worked on the technology, right? I mean, both uh, when it first came oh, out, the nice an employee and also then in uh, SAP's engineering team. Now, the, the good part of it is um, HANA did become quite popular as a database inside SAP. Right? Inside the suite, it, it added tremendous value. So by no means is it a failure. But I think that uh, where SAP probably got it less than right uh, is in thinking that that would be like the uh, one-size-fits-all solution for the world. Mm. Uh, and what, what actually happened is the sheer number of databases available became so big, but the same two, three, four uh, large companies still hold vast majority of the commercial database market, right? That did not change very much at all. And they say we did not become the number two there, right? So uh, I think that one needs to be called out, right? I mean, it's uh, it was a little bit of a misplaced bravado, I would think. Yeah, and this is for another show, but we could debate... Uh... I think one of the big second guesses in enterprise software is is whether SAP should have open sourced HANA from the beginning. But let's let's table that for now. But that would that would make a great long discussion. Yes, um, that probably needs uh, a lot more of our other friends to join in in that discussion. I- indeed, um, and and Alan, your points that you're making on uh, people overestimating the short term and the prediction and. Pr- overall predictive technologies just hang in there if you can because we're going to get to some of those topics um but absolutely uh yeah you can never go wrong predicting ai is going to be bigger in the future which leads to my next one which is about ai uh i got one from dxc technology congratulations for making the cut of my least favorite predictions uh this might be an idc prediction though i can't quite tell from the wording but by 2021, most major businesses will provide, ready for this, some type of customer experience centered around AI as companies progress past proof of concepts and move into production. So my big problem with that prediction is, well, I guess some type of customer experience, yeah, if you include really crappy customer experiences, then maybe that's true. Um, I don't trust that companies are going to implement so-called AI in a way that improves customer experience. And also, I would say that most of those are going to be more like robotic bots that respond to certain situations rather than learning experiences with machines. AI, to me, even in a narrow context, should imply learning from interactions. And I'm not seeing that in the customer experience space. So. Uh, we know plenty of examples of it it not working really well right i mean my my favorite and you know this would have been one of mine as well um is linkedin job recommendations right i don't know how to switch it off otherwise i would have uh, right. you know not done it uh it does send me emails from time to time you know i think every week or every month something like that but often enough to annoy me um <laughs> it Usually it is for uh, a truck driver in Phoenix um, or a vice president of a catering company, um, things of that nature. And I I know what, what is happening, right? They are either trying to match my location, seeing that I live in Phoenix, or they see my title as vice president and they look at the next vice president opening. It, it's like so bad it's so ridiculously bad that i think they're better off not doing this right in um um than than doing any recommendation at all i have in so far and i've used linkedin for a very long time uh, uh, unbelievable that in all these years i haven't seen one recommendation that makes sense i mean that takes some doing right that how can you be so bad that at, at the end right in 10 years you cannot make one recommendation that makes sense Absolutely. Uh, and Alan says it's the little things in AI, autocomplete sentences in Gmail is a perfect example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I, I actually turn off Gmail's auto stuff. I can't stand it, but but there are some examples of real improvements. I would say, like, for example, uh, voice recognition has gotten so much better. Um, I'm, I'm, I use regularly use in my journalistic work. <laughs> I, I use uh, Otter AI for tra- transcription of my interviews, and I'm exceedingly impressed by 
how the progress that they've made. Uh, whether I would consider that true AI or not, we could discuss, but it's definitely, that stuff's gotten better and better. So those specific use cases make sense. It does. And it has disrupted some industries as well, right? I mean, one that I'm very familiar with was when I was in college, uh, school and college, um, India had a, a, a very big industry on medical transcription, right? So the rough idea is a doctor in the U.S. would, you know, speak into a, a device to record um, and then that gets transferred over to India and then somebody will type it up and, and send it back. Massive industry. I remember seeing so many advertisements for those jobs in, in newspapers and so on. Till uh, these voice-to-text translators started becoming really good, that industry practically vanished or, or got cut down in size. That Now when I go to visit my mom, um, I don't see those anymore. Right? It's, uh, it's not a mainstream thing. I'm sure it exists in some, some shape or, or form even, even today, but it's, it's not a big thing. So uh, AI absolutely is making, and that is machine learning, right? It, it, it does make use of machine learning in a significant way. Uh, and it has gotten better. And a uh, lot of research has happened. There are all kinds of ethics challenges that come with that too. But nevertheless, um, so AI has scaled in, in many situations. But I will make a point in the enterprise setup, right? There are many, many companies that we work with that we routinely see have large data science teams that can do prototypes and come up with good ideas, but they rarely scale. And there are many, many reasons why things don't scale. Um, it is kind of like how security was in the past, where security was not like an enterprise-wide thing. Now it is, uh, thanks to all the cyber threats and so on. Um, now, you know, now you can say, you know, like in the last minute, like if I'm sending code to production, the a uh, week before Thanksgiving and it's going to give the company a lot of money because of some fancy algorithm. If I say there is a security bug, the CIO will not think two times, right? They will say, pull the code out of production. Nobody will take that risk. But if I say, oh, I suspect uh, that might be using a biased uh, data or biased model, right? The, the AI algorithm. Uh, I'm not sure how many companies will stop it, right? It's so um, AI... Is, is going through that path where there is some more maturity that is needed before it becomes mainstream in a highly scaled environment. There are hundreds of reasons which we, we can't get into uh, today, but uh, certainly it has not scaled like it was predicted, nowhere close to it uh, in, in enterprise land. Right, yeah. I, I think when I was talking about the pervasiveness of AI, I was really thinking more about things like consumer technology and stuff. It's true that the enterprise scalability of of AI is is limited unless you want to throw in things like fraud protection and very narrow industry use cases where there has been some strides. But oh, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Um, all right. So, what's your number two most uh, hate dislike prediction? So my I somehow have only one more, not uh, two more. Okay. Well, let's do your number one then. That's fine. The number one was uh, by twenty, I, and I forgot which analyst firm uh, predicted it. Uh, maybe multiple ones did, that uh, by 2020, there will be this massive job loss due to automation, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, that certainly did not happen, right? That most certainly did not happen, even though there is plenty of automation. It's not that automation came down. Automation actually increased many, many fold, even between like 2015 and, and today. Uh, and I live I live this life, right? So I, I get to watch this up close <clears throat> Uh, automation did happen in in to an extreme, but uh, the people just got redeployed. Right, the the skills um, that people had, they did just enhanced, and they started doing other things. I don't know of one person, at least in 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 the limited worldview that I have, I don't know of anybody who got um, you know let go because of automation. Mm -hmm. And um, and those skills, right, that they had in 2015 still continue to be relevant. If you were a good Java programmer, then you're still a very good uh, uh, consultant or, or engineer today, right? Uh, or much more valuable today. Because lots and lots more high-value tasks need such skills today. But I think the original prediction was probably not about the people I'm talking about. It's probably people with uh, lower level of skills. But even there, 
I'm not seeing people, you know, in shipping base getting, um, um, you know, uh, getting fired or anything of that nature either, right? So I think that was also a rather misplaced fear that automation in the short term will cause massive unemployment. Pandemic, unfortunately, caused massive unemployment, but I don't think automation caused massive unemployment, at least not yet. So, 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 just real quick on that, why, why do you think everyone got that wrong? What, what did they, what did they miss? I, I think exuberance for technology, and some of it was, I, I at least with a couple of analysts, uh, friend, well. Um, I wouldn't call them friends, but people who are well respected, right? It, it, there was a bit of grandstanding on that issue, right? It's it's not mm-hmm. that it was backed by by data. There there were people who questioned it, um, you know, with data. Like uh, Vinny, our friend Vinny Vinny Machanani, uh, was on the right side of that equation, right? Saying yep. uh, no, automation is not going to do that in the in near term. So over a long period of time, these things might all happen. You know, UBI and other things need to be discussed. Yes, that's all fair. But in the short term, right, all those predictions were like right. dead wrong. And I think it was people overestimating the uh, maturity of technology, right? AI is a classic example, right? If AI did scale, probably every call center agent would have been displaced by now. But AI did right. not scale to, to that extent, right? So um, a lot of it was just misplaced trust that technology will mature faster in the short term. So and, and like what your viewer, I forgot his name, was it Alan, um, who just, just mentioned about uh, um, this prediction or, or this comment, right, um, about mm. uh, the impact of technology in the short term gets overestimated. Oh, the short term, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is a spot on comment, right? Uh, I think that's exactly what happened. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's let's breeze through our number ones because I want to get to the top, your top five favorite blog posts. Um, so uh, my number one, I just it's really just a classic headline. Uh, robots powered by soft skills could become future business leaders. I just love it. <laughs> like we're, we're we're ready to have robots take over leadership. <laughs> to be fair, there I, I think what happens is there's so many bad leaders that we start thinking that machines could do a better job. Um, but I, I just love it. I'm convinced that that this prediction will come true at some point, exactly for that reason. Because there are so many uh, bad leaders um, in in the world that uh, this should not be uh, that difficult to do. But uh, letting go of the bad leader, good leader construct in a classic hierarchical organization, many levels of the hierarchy are purely for aggregation function, right? As in somebody needs to take $10 and allocate it to 10 people based on something, or some other person needs to aggregate $1 from 10 people and and report up. These are eminently things that a robot should be doing, should have never been done by a human being to begin with. These, I I wish and pray that these get automated. Those managers have no no reason to exist in the corporate world and, and should go away. Well, see, I think I think that's Alan's point, right? He's saying, isn't isn't that what B schools have been turning out for years? I mean, I mean, look, I mean, crappy robotic leaders uh, make us want to replace them with machines. I totally get that. Yeah, cra- crappy managers should at least be replaced with better managers, right? Uh, there, there's like n- no sympathy in in my mind, right? Because I've had crappy managers in the past. I try. Really, really, the, the day that people tell me I'm a crappy manager is when I stop uh, working in the corporate world, right? World doesn't need crappy managers. It, they do more disservice than practically anything else I can think of. Yeah, Den, I don't think the Den Hallett, I don't think the Dennis Hallett robot is quite ready for prime time yet. <laughs> I saw a flash that he came in. If, 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 if we can approximate that, then AI has truly arrived, but I don't see it. <laughs> I don't see it yet, <laughs> though. Though the press release did imply that machines are getting better at sarcasm, I would certainly enjoy seeing that, but uh, haven't run into it yet. My my personal home devices never use sarcasm on me. I, I would, for one, would enjoy it. But all right, Vijay, let's move on to the uh, your top five blog posts because we're running out of time, and I don't want to I don't want to miss this part. What we've done, I've challenged Vijay to pick. His top five blog posts of all time, which and that's a considerable amount of posts, VJ. Um, most of which you typed on your iPhone, but that's a whole different uh, 
that's a whole different discussion. There, there are probably uh, less than ten percent of, or, or maybe less than five percent of all blogs that I typed on a laptop. Um, so, ninety-five percent of my posts are on the phone. If there was no WordPress app on the phone, Vijay wouldn't be a blogger, right? I mean, that that much is very clear. And and you know, before we before we get into your your top five, and I'm going to pick out a few that I liked as well as we go. Um, the one interesting thing is that when you started your blog off your own and VJ says blog, you gave yourself pretty wide latitude to write about whatever the heck you wanted um, from India to pets, to, uh, yeah, to, music, to, to, food, to technology, to leadership, to whatever. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, I think that served you well over the years. It gives you a pretty wide berth and, and, you know, we kind of talked about how the pandemic, has kind of brought that into focus where the blurring of the lines between personal and professional, but you were onto that <clears throat> in your, in your blog a long time ago. So <clears throat> anyhow, so, so VJ, give, give us number, your, your, your top five, start with number five. Number five was a, uh, an HR themed blog where I said, talent cannot be managed. Uh, oh. That caused a, a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, interest in 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 the circle of friends we have right in in social media. Um, but I, what I meant by talent there is the extraordinarily talented people, um, and that caused a lot of grief because that's uh, the general idea of talent management is to unify a management system for all kinds of talent. Um, and I was just trying to point out that that doesn't work to the supremely talented people. Uh, and then Chris Payne and I got into a back-to-back -back blockchain where he blocked based on mine and I blocked um, uh, based on his and so on. I think it went like back and forth two or three times. And uh, it was one of my most read blogs of all time, most commented blogs of all time as well. My number four uh, is I put myself uh, in, in the client's shoes and I wrote a blog on six tips for clients buying SAP services. Uh, oh. Uh, this one, you know, uh, mixed reaction. <laughs> oh, bet, yeah. <laughs> You're trying to sales proof your own uh, prospects there. Ouch. <laughs> so, uh, I I just told uh, clients what what to look for, right? In in a, in a, in a consulting company. Um, Was there any? Were there any of them, or were they were particularly uh, controversial? Um, I, I actually don't remember the content all that much yeah. a few years ago. But what I do remember is. Uh, in the next maybe three months after I wrote that blog, customers that I was talking to, trying to sell things, would pull up this blog, show me, and say that, okay, I'm just going to follow these six steps, right, to see uh, how you stack up. And I was like, oh, my God, if I thought, right, that, that you would have read that, I would have at least read it one more time before walking into this meeting because now I don't remember anymore what are the six things that I suggested on the top of my head. Uh, but nevertheless, right, it proved one point to me very quickly, which was good. It establishes an instant rapport with uh, the client because whatever I think of a topic, right, I write it with no holes barred in my blog. So by the time uh, you know I get into a meeting and if they don't know me, they would usually Google me or something, uh, these blogs will come up, right? So they have a good idea of what my point of view is. So we have a starting point for most discussions. So uh, blogs did help me um, on, on that front, right? It was not done consciously, but it did have some good karma payback. Uh, a couple of comments from Den Hallett I want to bring in. First of all, he says you upped your Zoom game, so he likes your production values. Uh, but he also says you're a great storyteller. Follow that and you'll be a star. Um, and, you know, I, I would also add to that, to Den's point around storytelling. And and I want to get in at the end of our show, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of blogging on your career. But um, the other thing I would add is I think you're, you're, you're a very, in your blog, you're a very relatable person. And you put a human side to things. You don't present yourself as like a top executive sharing guru tips. You, you acknowledge your own failings and struggles. And, and also who else would pick, which is my number four for you, uh, 
please read this before you get a puppy. I mean, how many enterprise blogs would, would use that as a topic, but it's the kind of thing that kind of is disarming. And, you know, I think you, you spice it up just enough with stuff like that. So anyhow, that's my number four pick for you. Oh, I, I appreciate that. That one, uh, I got a lot of, uh, lot of new friends. Thanks. To oh, and by, by the way, some good photos in that one too. Yes. So. So, and I got a new puppy as well around that time, right? So that was part of the reason why I wrote it. And seeing him, a lot of my friends got new puppies as well. But they all had similar questions. And I'm like a constant reference guy for, you know, puppy questions. It's it's very common because I've kept dogs for a long time. So uh, that was the background for that. But I enjoyed writing that one. Um, my my number three pick was uh, we... we uh, implemented SAP HANA in four days and lived to tell the story. That was when yeah. <laughs> that was when SAP HANA was brand new as an SAP hadn't even publicly come out with it. And I, I was running what was called the forward engineering team in, in IBM at that time. That who was the our charter was to look at new technologies and see if there is a future for our clients. So me, Gagan, uh, Thomas Crojil, uh, a few guys, um, Rafikul and uh, we we got together. It was a complete uh, group of uh, nearly strangers. I knew Gagan from before, but n- nobody else. So these were IBMers from around the world that I got together, and none of us knew Hannah. I said nobody on the planet knew Hannah outside SAP Labs at that time. And we uh, stood up a server in one of our data centers. We implemented it, and we did a project on it, and and it worked. And it it took only four days. Mm. It was good enough that uh, Vishal then uh, put it up on a TechEd or Sapphire keynote. Um, so yeah, we, I was going to say, I bet you got a nice friendly phone call from your buddy Vishal after that one. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I, that, I, S, not, SAP marketing could never have conjured up something that brilliant in a million years. <laughs> yeah, it was like a working capital management solution. I think I, I showed that to Dennis and he later wrote something on ZDNet or something about that. Um uh, but that was a, a lot of fun, not just because of the blog. The blog definitely proved the point that um, things can be done fast and for very little money, and it wouldn't take a structured team, right? A lot of people passionate about the topic, just like how Dennis was part of, and, and I think you were too, right? Of part of ESME, the, the messaging platform that yeah, was developed on, on SAP and shown in one of the TechEd code jams. So that that was the inspiration for us too. That you know, if we get enough interested people to come together, um, that that one um, that one could work. Uh, just real quick, VJ, we got a f- few things. Uh, Dan made the point around your authenticity uh, that a lot of people uh, find terrifying to disclose that kind of stuff, and I, I agree. I mean, that's the, but that I think that's what gives your writing some power that other people don't have. Um, and then Mark really liked your uh, puppy. Uh, blog so you have some puppy fans there there you go um and then den actually has a project question for you i'm not sure if this is within the scope of stuff you can answer but he he's talking about amex uh how did, how did you make a G, gbs gts work in a way that is win 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 are you able to talk about that or yeah 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 i'm ha- happy to talk about that i can't talk about specifics but you know the uh, question is something i can i can probably answer so i did not come from an infrastructure background myself right i'm a, i'm a good engineer so i understand technology um, and i've done uh, consulting right the management consulting technology consulting for a long time so that part the gbs part of the business i knew very well but what also worked very well in my favor is um, the leader for the GTS business um, is a very dear friend. And I had a lot of mentors who grew up in the GTS business who was who were completely willing to, to coach me in a, in a short period of time. So it, it was done the hard way. I, I had to learn a lot from scratch that I did not know. It's a new business model. The technology, I'm largely familiar with IBM's technology. So that was the easy part. But how that business was run, is most simply, it was a bunch of very generous people who um, took the time to to teach me, right, and answer a hundred questions. So that 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 is all there is to it, right? No no big secret. Plus everything that we we solve um, at Amex, right? Um, it's it's a client that we have had for a long time. So it's not as if we wake up one day trying to impress them. Um, you know, it's a relationship that has existed for 107 years. So 
that gives me a, a, a lot of freedom because that trust is already there that um, when they have a problem, then we can think through uh, a, a solution jointly. It, it's very rare that we have to go to a back room, find a solution, come back, right? So we work very closely with each other. So most of the solutions are built together. We have very transparent conversations uh, to the extent possible. So uh, no no big secret behind great working relationships, right? Both both with the GTS friends as well as with the client. That trust is the is the reason that it, this works, right? It's not brilliance or uh, any any secret sauce. It's just a lot of a lot of learning and and a lot of trust with with people and that, it's, that's the true that's true for most things in business right it's 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 all about people it's funny you should say that because after all the use cases i've done for diginomica over the years now uh, i i start pushing back on vendors a lot around trying to present these uh, dramatic transformation stories because what i'm really looking for is i'm looking for how gritty the partnership is how much it was tested i'm looking for the hard parts and i'm looking for essentially how hard people wanted to get it right and how hard they worked to get over the hump. And to me, that's a successful project in the end. You always find that ingredient. The technology might be great, fine, but that's the thing that I always see is that you've established a trust. Otherwise, those high-stake products are never going to happen. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, oh, J Den says uh, he started with, thanks, Hun, for getting that in. I'm, I'm going to assume that's a typo when he meant to say John. I'm really hoping that's a typo. Um, <laughs> He says, uh, Mabel says hello. That's that's my dog walking friend. That's that's Den's dog. So we got to go. Hello back to Mabel. She's a very, very pretty girl. Oh, she's she's gorgeous. I, I miss her terribly, actually. Mark, trust is the not so secret sauce indeed, right? Um, and, and Mark, that's why I think unvarnished stories are the good stories because in the end, every project had really miserable points and quit throwing up these case studies that don't discuss them because they happen. Let's let's find out how you got over them. That's the key. Yeah, I, I'll make a, a 30 second commercial on that point, right? A, a lot of AI projects talk about, you know, the cool stuff that AI did. If you talk to the machine learning team that worked on it, 90% of their struggles probably is to clean the data. Right? The most unsexy part of their life is these PhD level, super intelligent people sitting there cleaning the data and trying to figure out how to make use of what, what they have, right? That that almost never gets discussed, right? And the, the sheer amount of effort and pain that goes into making it work. No, everybody jumps into the cool statistical models and the latest, greatest hardware on which it runs and quantum computing and so on, right? No, 90%, right? And maybe I'm exaggerating a little, but it is certainly more than 80%. I can say that with certainty of the effort is in just cleaning up data, right? Which is not a particularly high skill task, but it is no. boring and painful, but has to be done. Needs to be talked about, right? But it it's, it doesn't get air time. I, I remember chatting with a, a startup, a chatbot startup a couple of years ago and making fun of how dumb bots are. And the guy got mad and he said, my bot is as dumb as your data. You know, if you give me good data, I'll, I'll give you a good bot. I thought that was a really interesting point. Um, and finally, we have a nice clarification from Dennis that Hun equal John. So I'm glad we got that sorted. Thanks, Den. Uh, all right. Uh, just real quick on, on my number three uh, VJ post. Uh, we're not going to discuss it because I want to get to the last few. But my number three is, uh, is a, for, I think, a couple years ago, relearning leadership again. And I just picked it because you have a lot of interesting posts on leadership. And you talk in the post, Brown how your interest in leadership started for a simple and awkward reason. In the early part of your career, you had some really awful managers. So you kind of go through that and, and talk about how learning to be a good leader is a journey and never a destination and there's no magic bullets and such. And so anyway, I, th I thought that post kind of set the tone for a lot of your leadership posts, which I encourage readers to check out. So yeah, I've, I've had spectacular failures in, in, in my career, right? So uh, it comes from a point of authenticity, authenticity for that reason that uh, uh, lots of uh, stumbling blocks throughout. And I had some pretty crappy managers and some exceptionally good managers. So uh, I try to do more of what the exceptional guys did for me. And um, I, I try really, really hard not to let my team suffer what I suffered when I had crappy managers. So that's uh, that's the gist of it. Cool. What's your number two all-time favorite blog post? 
Number two, would have, it was a close choice between number two and number one. Number two is the road ahead for SAP Consultants series. Ah, uh, the classic, especially, yep. Especially the last one I did, which was seven or eight years ago um, on my own blog. Usually I used to write it in SAP's blog. Uh, recently, somebody found me and, and sent me a link from one of the older SAP ACN blogs. But it doesn't have my name anymore because I think SAP kind when they migrated platforms or something, um, it it lost my identity. So I think it's now say something like posted by anonymous user or something like that. Mm. But those were uh, well read, well discussed, um, and I used to spend a lot of time talking and analyzing before I posted those. So. Uh, those are, you know, emotionally very, very close to my heart. Um, and I think I, I would at least like to think it helped a lot of people. This is Jonathan Yarmus clarifying something from an earlier comment on underestimating change, even in the medium term. Uh, go back in the comment thread to see how that emerged. Um, that, that was no, the com comment on uh, the yeah. short versus long term uh, AI yeah. impact, right? And and Jonathan yeah. is totally right, right? Absolutely, two hundred percent. I'm not showing the mullet denim. It's in an awkward phase right now. So when it gets in a better phase, we'll show it off. Uh, Den has another project question for you, VJ. Uh, this one I think a little tougher, actually tougher question. Uh, where do you see the trust issue going in the digital world? Could MX be that trusted org? If so, how? Digital trust is tougher. There's no question about that. Yeah, um, I cannot answer the uh, the Amex question, right? That that would be getting into uh, a level of detail that I probably shouldn't go into uh, in, in this call. But um, the, the question of trust is still um, largely a, a valid one. Uh, many, many different uh, technology solutions to that as well. But one of the recent discussions that, that came up is with, with the allegations of massive fraud in, in U.S. elections and uh, one camp saying that digital uh, voting is better than uh, the paper votes, centralized voting is better than the decentralized ones, so on and so forth. But one, one thing I think we can learn is there are uh, places like elections where a decentralized, uh, rather manual and uh, you know, uh, maybe inefficient in terms of time process has a ton of advantages over uh, over over digital, right? So uh, when we talk about trust, it is not just digital, right? Just because we have a very recent example to to talk about, but within um, the domain of trust itself, um, the the digital aspects are are super key. One of the things that uh, I am now um, struggling to think through is. If and when this pandemic thing goes away and we get back on the road and, you know, I, I start flying, hopefully not as much as I used to in the past. I have a few million miles under my belt, not looking forward to a lot more. But if you are and things like um, your vaccination records and so on need, need to be there, right, for uh, uh, you to be uh, boarding a plane or, or a train and so on. Uh, how do we establish um, a, a trusted uh, identity for that, right? As in somebody that everybody agrees on that, you know, if, if I say I'm vaccinated, uh, that record should be trusted somehow, right? So will it get attached to my global entry card, right? Or my trusted traveler number? Or will it uh, go sit with my American Airlines uh, frequent flyer number? But who trusts what is a, is a significant um, difficulty, and it is very difficult for any one organization to be trusted, right? That That is the crux of the difficulty. Not everybody will agree that any one organization can be trusted. We don't even trust each other's governments in most cases, right? So these passport checks and visas and so on, right, go into a lot of issues, um, which I faced a lot in my, my life, right, as a traveler. There are countries where <laughs> yeah, it's partly as a joke, but, you know, it did happen. People open a visa scan and all of that, but then they, because I have a very long name, they count the number of characters in my name, and then they count the number of characters that show in the computer to, to double check whether I am who I say I am, right? That is the level of mistrust that exists uh, across entities uh, around the world. Yeah, and Dan's point around trust being the elephant in, in the room for digital biz is, I think, absolutely true. And, you know, it, it dictates a lot of decisions I make about what I do with e-commerce online, for sure. 
And, and I, I also find it very weird. The brands I do trust, like I trust Amazon. Why should I? But I kind of do, right? Because I've been ordering for them for years, but it's weird. Like, should I really trust them? Anyway, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, and convenience trumps many things, right? I mean, that's the other, other difficult. Amazon is a classic example, right? We, my, my family is a heavy shopper on, on Amazon as well, right? Uh, do I trust them is a question that I'm very uncomfortable answering myself, right? Um, the, knowing how technology works, there are definitely reasons to, to, to worry about, but convenience trumps a lot of that, right? And um, uh, it's, it's a I don't trust them with my doorbell security. I'll tell you that, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> All right. My, my number two VJ uh, blog post, um, there were a few controversial ones from your archives. I already mentioned the agile one earlier, which was classic agile bashing. A uh, uh, number of years ago, this was the slippery slope of predictive analytics, which was, I, I, I saw you kind of putting a stake in the ground in that blog post around all the, predictive and AI hype that was to come in the years to follow. And uh, there's a classic paragraph in here. Uh, after the Super Bowl game finished, I saw on Twitter that SAP had predicted that Denver will win over Seattle in a close match. As it turned out, Seattle won a rather one-sided match with a very young side. A few friends on Twitter pointed out that SAP made a <laughs> bad prediction before the game, and they are not wrong. Uh, <laughs> But anyhow, uh, it, you know, you get in trouble uh, when you make high stakes predictions. And, uh, you know, anyway, I thought that was a classic post. Yeah. And, and a, a big part of uh, predictions, right? When it comes to binary decisions, predictions are pretty risky, right? Like who will win, who will not, and so on. People don't win. If you say that, you know, candidate X has a 60% chance of winning, doesn't translate to candidate X is the one who is going to win. Um, and this we face in business all the time, right? Because we do a lot. I mean, in my line of work, right, for the last several years, we do a lot of these projects where we have to weigh two options and um, come up with some analysis that says one has a higher chance of occurring than the other. And usually before I make a presentation, I do a little uh, spot check on the, uh, you know, on the on the minimal probability knowledge of um of the audience and many a times i've taken 10 minutes to level set on the fundamentals this is what things mean if you say statistical significance this is what statistical significance means it doesn't mean importance right so mm -hmm. uh, these kinds of things um a part of predictive analytics is also an education problem I right you had a really good one on correlation and causality at one point too that tied into all of that yeah Highly correlated uh, doesn't mean it, it makes any sense in real life. It also doesn't mean that it is important, right? So, mm. uh, you know, like, you know, cheese price and uh, a number of uh, shoes available on a desk might be um, correlated, right? Because just mathematically, those numbers are correlated. It doesn't mean squat, right? It's uh, So when people don't have that sense of business uh, or if they don't understand the statistical terms and we throw it around lightly, all kinds of misinterpretations happen and people make very binary decisions like 69% chance of something happening and they would say, okay, then let me double down and throw all my budget into option A. No, please don't do that, right? I mean, that's the that's the whole idea here, right? To educate them on what it actually means when a, a model tells them something, uh, it is not easy. And this is also why predictions made by AI don't always translate very nicely into dashboards because dashboards need to give people some pretty precise information or people generally tend to think in binary terms, right? Yes, no, or low, medium, high, and so on. And then they make decisions based on that without comprehending what this model is trying to say. So a, a little bit of that is purely a, a, an education level set before you present this information. All right, before we end the show, we're gonna do our number one picks. Uh, I've got a doozy and we're gonna do yours. But before that, I want to get to Den's follow-up question because he's he's nailing us down here. Convenience is fine in consumer, but what about B2B thoughts? It's yeah, B2B um, also um, convenience actually trumps um, in, in many, many cases, right? Unless it is for regulatory reasons or it's about the general ledger and so on, uh, convenience actually trumps ma uh, vast majority of uh, business transactions too, right? So uh, the general idea and most sa salespeople or sales managers coach their staff, right? That 
lower the friction you know higher your chance of success so uh, even if your price is high and so on if you make it easier to work with you generally companies buy from you right so even in b2b transactions um the this ease of doing business usually trumps every other obstacle um in in lo- in lots of cases not in all cases but in 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 lots of cases. You know one thing that's interesting though VJ that I think has changed in B2B is that I think 10 years ago there was a lot more catering to the so-called convenience of the super user who could like understand and work their way through 10 to 20 different screens in an ERP program to get something done. And these days I think convenience is defined much more by business users and casual users rather than the super user might not might have to give up their their super user view in order to like, you know, move to a different software program that's more amenable to business users where adoption is now everything. Totally, totally, totally. Uh, I do have one grief though, as a largely casual user of many of these systems, right? HR systems and so on. Uh, And I wrote a blog on that recently as well. Uh, The idea should not be to make the casual user have a miniaturized version of what a super user does, right? Like, for me, I had to go make a small update on some HR little thing, payroll deduction of some sort. Uh, and it took some some time to to figure out how to get that transaction. I had to Google, I had to call a, a friend for help and so on. And my point was why, right? This, this should not be this complex. If it's a one-click thing, then why do I need to go through three screens and, and look at documentation to understand? That's a power user problem. That should not be how a... Ca- so the casual user, user experience is something that all these companies, this particular example was Workday, right? So I'll, I'll mention it up front. But this is not just a Workday problem. There are many, many casual user use cases where the UX is not simplified. Many a times, you know, I only care about sending an SMS and get an answer, right? I don't need a screen. I don't need an app. Don't make me do these things, right? So uh, you people have to, these, these big software vendors have to rethink the casual user experience. The solution cannot be that oh, I took a super user screen and eliminated 15 fields. Maybe we don't need a screen at all, right? Why why make life more difficult than it needs to be? Mm. Um, yeah, Den says, thanks for putting the question up. And yeah, uh, the rule of the show is uh, we interrupt the gurus uh, to, to answer the question. So uh, this isn't the typical talking head crap you're going to see on LinkedIn where people drone on and on. Um, I, I interrupt the speakers all the time. That's just how it goes. This is a uh, envision as a talk radio style thing. So, oh, and and Den says uh, also he wants us to get you some Grecian two thousand subscriptions. So I don't know, uh, Den Den's got a lot of aesthetic issues with with stuff, but that's okay. Yeah, um, you know w- we know we know that Den's probably never going to live down some of his early video appearances. So, JDOD. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so I'm gonna um, before we get to your number one, I want to do my number one because I want to save yours for last. So my number one is from 2014, and I encourage readers to go back in the NVJ says blog to check this one out. Why I am not holding my breath on digital transformation, an all time classic, where you begin by insulting the entire digital transformation industry by comparing digital transformation to change management. <laughs> and that basically people couldn't sell change management anymore. So, uh, so, you know, they switched it over and, um, and, and, and bottom line, um, check out the comments to the blog, check out Esteban Kolsky's reactions, all classic interacts between Esteban and VJ on here, uh, <laughs> including where he says, to you a well-reasoned post relying on an antiquated stance never thought i'd see this from you and we take it from there into a very spicy comment thread um you're gonna you're gonna friggin love that post you got to go check it out it's it's all all time there there are two things i remember about that post one was that i was flying from uh, new york to phoenix um, you know, when Esteban started commenting. So I was commenting from a, a plane seat on, on my um, uh, on my iPhone. <laughs> and the second part was, I think less than a year after that post is when my title at IBM actually changed to VP of Digital Transformation. 
Yeah, exactly. That and and that's the that's the paradox or curse of your of your post. Whenever you deconstruct something, you're going to be selling it. That's just how it goes. That is how it goes. So, that is absolutely how it goes. I I will never live that down, right? I mean, how many people gave me grief on, you know, when <laughs> they saw that title? Yeah, and now you're an agile digital transformation specialist who can help clients with their blockchain I, problems. I, I still don't say digital transformation at all. I, I yeah. continue to believe it's a meaningless term, right? It's a, a catch-all that that means nothing to me. I mean, I, I, I won't diss on people who say it these days, but uh, I, I've given up on it, but I still don't say digital transformation at all. I, I, I don't know what that means, honestly. Even today, I don't know what that means, right? So I, I, I would... I'm still consistent in my belief system that it it did not mean anything to me five years ago. It still doesn't mean much to me today. All right, VJ, drum roll. What's your number one all time favorite blog post, man? So uh, there, there might be a recency bias to this, right? So with that caveat, uh, it is a post that I wrote the day I became a U.S. citizen, a uh, little over a year ago. Uh, cool. Um, it uh, literally is my most read blog of all time, right? In the 10 or 15 years that I've blogged. Um, it also is special for another reason that uh, on LinkedIn, um, I saw the the good and bad of the world in, in one shot, in a very short period of time, right? In the one hour after I, I posted that, 90% uh, of the people, I put it on LinkedIn for a simple reason that vast majority of the people that I have known over my career are across countries and LinkedIn generally everybody will notice that update. I don't have everyone's email and phone numbers and so on to share the news. Um, so that's why I put it on LinkedIn. Otherwise, this probably would have been in, in Facebook. So uh, I did put it on LinkedIn just so just so that people see that. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people, I mean, practically all from India, uh, took serious offense that I'm mm. celebrating losing Indian citizenship. Um, thankfully, 90% of the people who commented uh, were very positive and supportive. But it was an emotional moment for me because I already lived here for you know close to 20 years at that time. Uh, and that legal immigration system is pretty broken. But I, I did get through it the right way. And I was pretty proud that I did. But to see the reaction on, on these either extremes, right? Complete strangers congratulating me, welcoming me. Um, and then again, complete strangers disowning me, having no idea of, you know, my, my attachment to India and that my parents still live there and, uh, and so on. I mean, that, so from a, a, a blogging perspective, you know, I often think, right, of the good and bad of blogging from an engagement perspective, that blog just goes to the top of my list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing for me, too, is, you know, I don't want to get too political on, on this show. Uh, it's not the point, but that that embodies like what I've always cared about with the U.S. is this notion that, you know, the the best, the most passionate, the most talented people like that, that love it here and want to be a part of it eventually become. And I would like to think that every country would have a similar mentality towards uh, embracing immigrant populations. And, and unfortunately that's not where the world has been headed so much lately. So, uh, I think it really resonates for that reason as well. And unfortunately it's not as common a story as it should be right now. So, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm sure it will change for the better, right? But these stories need to be told. Oh, hundred percent. All right. Well, uh, VJ, before we wrap, I just want to ask you, uh, you know, with all, with your blogging exploits over the years, do you think your career would be in the same place if you hadn't blogged at all? Would you have, would you be in the role that you're in now? Would you have achieved what you had? Like, what is the relationship there? You know, um, I mean, this is just to be honest. I mean, John did give me an indication. So I did uh, think about it right before I came on, um, on this video. Um, it, here is what I think. I'm fairly sure. Um, I probably would have progressed through my career just the same somehow, uh, but I don't think I would have enjoyed it nearly as much. Mm. Nearly as much. Uh, blogging gives me a, a, a lot of perspective because it makes me think hard before I, uh, I do something. It is definitely a venting mechanism, right? It, it's a sharing mechanism. Um, it, it, it makes me, you know, it, it, it's a, uh, I don't know, what, what is the right way to say it, right? makes me fulfilled in, in, in some ways. So from a pure career progression perspective, 
I mean, what what helps me progress in my career? You know, my technology skills, my sales skills, and so on. One way or the other, I would like to think that. Pro- and I'm sure blogging helped. I'm not saying it didn't, but with or without it, probably I, I would have made it to where where I am today. But yeah. I have zero doubts that I wouldn't have enjoyed it as much as much as in by like an order of magnitude. Uh, I can say with certainty, right? Bro- blogging is a big big part of my my identity now my what makes me feel happy um, and blogging not in the sense of blogging on my blog itself right it could be a tweet it could be a facebook post or a linkedin post but that ability to express myself when i want to uh, without fear of repercussion and and so on that's a a huge part um Mm. And it is quite possible. Maybe I'm not totally objective. Maybe it did help me. Um, there is at least one case where it did help me significantly. And Mark Finner knows this. Um, when I was a young senior manager in, in IBM, uh, thanks to blogging, you know, I had the ability to, uh, or the good fortune to go meet several top leaders at SAP, you know, McDermott and uh, Hasso and Vishal and so on. Um And that happened at a time where, you know, people a few levels above me in in IBM at the time uh, wouldn't have that much access to to the same executives. And that did help me for sure, right? So that one Mm -hmm. incident I do remember uh, definitely helped me uh, in getting some visibility in the the organization. But that's it. And then as I mentioned before, there are uh, clients who recognize me from um, from my blogs and consequently have uh, an easier time building a repo, um, which eventually leads to uh, faster sales and so on, right? So, uh, in direct ways, it it has helped uh, for sure. But in terms of a tangible nature, I I can't say for sure whether it actually helped my career or not. But in terms of making me fulfilled, which I think is much more important than whether I got a promotion due to blogging. You know, blogging did help me a ton. You know, feeling good about myself and. Uh, also, my ability to to pass what I learned to others, which is very important to me, uh, and also to learn, right? Because vast majority of the time when I post something, people will react, and I usually learn a ton from that reaction. So, yeah, blogging has been a, a huge net positive for me. Mm. Yeah, you know, I I, I kind of remember that anecdote because, and we've we've bashed SAP a few times during this video, so uh, might as well throw out that that was part of the SAP Blogger program, which was. Uh, you know, a very, very ahead of its time type of program in terms of putting so-called uh, influencers that didn't fit into a classic analyst category in the room with some of the <clears throat> top execs at SAP and having these op- open exchanges, which kind of set a standard that, you know, I, I like to try to find wherever I can. And it's still hard to find in a lot of places. And I, and I feel like I remember that, was it you, I think, around this time where where you you showed your manager your schedule and they were like, how did you get meetings with like Bill and Haas? Yeah, it, it was like, at that time, right? It was probably 10, 10 plus years ago. Like, I can't get those meetings. I mean, yeah. that's just, that's unbelievably classic. I mean, that's just so funny. Yeah. There, there was one other incident that uh, now I remember, uh, Dan and I both flew to, um, Germany to, to Frankfurt, right. To, oh, to yeah. um, to review something with Jim Schnabe uh, just before his Sapphire presentation. And uh, it was my boss's boss's boss who gave me a ride to San Jose airport to catch my flight. Uh, and I, I told him, uh, you know, that this is why I'm, I'm flying to Germany. And he was super duper impressed. Uh, and it also turned out that Jim said something very nice about me to uh, my boss's boss's boss at the time, right after that meeting. So, uh, it checked out as well, and he told me that, "Hey, I, for a second, I I did not believe your story in its entirety." But then, my very next meeting with Jim, uh, he did say that you know Vijay was very helpful, so um, that also helped, right? And none of that would have happened without the blogging and Marilyn and Mark and others uh, promoting it, and 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 so on. Yeah, and I think it's also sort of the uh, you know the blurring of the lines between content and community is the big thing, right? Like that, that your blogs put you in touch with so many people that you never would have known. And, you know, and I think that's a lot of the power of it as well. You know, Correct. I mean, I mean our, our friendship was sparked by me reading some of your, 
wrote ahead blogs and stuff. And you know. that, that's exactly true. That's how I met you. That's how I met Ben, uh, many others, right? Mark and 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 so on. And uh, uh, I also now remember that uh, I got into Twitter because you introduced me to Twitter when right. it had I don't know like a thousand people or so in it at that time. Um, but without your your prompting, I would have never blogged for sure. And uh, without your prompting, I would have never been on um, uh, on Twitter either, right? So you know, in many ways, John, you know, you have influenced a ton on on what I do now. Well, who knew? Just trying to do my thing is all. So uh, thanks for staying over. Uh, thanks to all who came into the peanut gallery as well. Much appreciated. Uh, and, uh, we'll do this again, but VJ really appreciate you looking back at all those blogs and picking out your faves for us. It was fun. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. And thanks for everybody who chimed in in between as well. Uh, next time, maybe we can get, uh, Dan and Mark and others onto the video as well. Right. So this was wonderful, John. Great format. Thanks for having me again. And, uh, hopefully it's not several years before we do this again. Yeah, exactly. All right, folks. Have a good evening. All right. Thanks.